morning. Um, welcome to Rockefeller University, and thank you very much for taking the time to join us today, whether you're here in person or on the web. Uh, my name is Frank Hoke. Uh, I head the communications group here. Before we get to the briefings, I wanted to give you a, just a quick snapshot of the university. Um, first, the exclusive focus here is biomedical research and education. We're currently home to 81 heads of laboratory, uh, six of whom are joining us today. Uh, there are no academic departments at Rockefeller University. Uh, instead, the, each faculty member reports directly to the president. This unusually flat structure translates into an extraordinary degree of independence for each scientist in developing his or her research program. Also on campus is the Rockefeller University Hospital, which is a 20-bed clinical research center that helps further develop uh, lab findings from, uh, from Rockefeller Labs in, in the clinic. Uh, second, although we are a university, we have no undergraduates. Uh, we call ourselves a university because we graduate about two dozen PhDs in the biomedical <coughs> sciences each year. Um, we were founded in 1901 as the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. Uh, in the U.S., Rockefeller was the first institution dedicated exclusively to laboratory research uh, as a path to understanding the underlying causes of disease. Um, our mission then and now, unchanged, is science for the benefit of humanity. Um, a point of pride for us, uh, to date, 25 scientists asso associated with the University have won the Nobel Prize, including five on the current faculty, and one of those, Mike Young, uh, will join us today. Um, we became a university in the 1950s when the graduate program was established, changed our name to the Rockefeller Uni University officially in 1965. Today we have about 1,800 employees on a 14-acre campus, although that will be changing soon. Out the window here you can see a pretty ambitious construct construction project underway. Um, it's being built in the airspace over the FDR Drive. Uh, it's a, essentially a new research building, three and a half city blocks long, but only two stories high. Uh, we don't consider it an expansion per se, as our faculty size will remain approximately the same. Instead, the goal is simply to provide scientists with um, modern, flexible lab space. The green roof will add two full acres to our 14-acre campus, uh, which is somewhat remarkable. Um, the new campus is scheduled to open uh, in spring of next year. Uh, our first sp speaker today is uh, Dr. Ju Chen. Uh, Ju received her undergraduate degree from Ohio University and her PhD from Harvard University. She became a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator in, in 2008 and joined Rockefeller's faculty in 2014. She's been named a Pew Biomedical Scholar, among other honors. Ju heads the Laboratory of Membrane Biology and Biophysics, using cryo-electron microscopy to explore the complex architecture of molecules with unprecedented detail. Today, she will discuss how the mutation that causes cystic fibrosis results in a defective membrane channel, uh, research that may open the door to new therapies. Ju. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your interest in our science. Uh, so I'm a structural biologist. What I mean is I study the shapes of molecules. The particular kind of molecules are called uh, ABC transporters. So those are proteins literally form molecular pump. So they, they situate in the membranes of our cells, and they actually use the energy from ATP like a little engine to pump molecules like nutrients into the cell or get rid of things we don't want, like metabolic uh, wastes. They also send out signaling molecules to communicate with other cells in the body. So, um, so why do I bother? So to, to look at the structure, to look at the details, how those molecules are shaped. So as we all know, molecules need to be shaped to perform functions, right? So if you need to cross the East River, and if I give you a log, it will be a little challenge for you to do that. That's why Indians f uh, figure out how to dock the log into a shape of a canoe so they can survive. So the same thing is for proteins and uh, also other mi micromolecules like DNA and RNA. They all have to form the correct shape to perform the function. And I just want to give you an example we're all very familiar with. We know antibodies are, are very important to get rid of viruses and bacteria in our body when we get an infection. And the, this is one of our former colleagues here explaining the structure of antibody. So it has two arms here so, uh, and also a, a, a constant region. This region will anchor it on the s to, to 
uh, on other immune molecules. But those, those two arms will recognize the antigen. Antigen in this case are foreign molecules. Could it be a bacteria, could it be a toxin, could it be a virus? The reason antibodies can recognize antigen with very precision and know this particular molecule is a bad molecule is because of its shape. So if you just look at that tip I circled here, this is the shape of the antibody that it will talk to the antigen, how precise these two surfaces will match each other, determines a good antibody or a bad antibody. A good antibody will match its antigen perfectly in shape. So the point I want to convey is just like any molecules, um, any materials, molecules in our body needs to have the right shape to perform the function. So particularly I want to focus on a, a particular transporter called the um, cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator, CFTR in short. So um, cystic fibrosis is the most prevalent genetic disease in Caucasian populations. It affects about one, to, uh, about one in 3,000 kids. So um, it has a variety of uh, problems, health issues, but the most severe one is accumulation of mucus in the lung. So that will cause uh, re 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 recurrent infection and also chronic in inflation of the lung, eventually leading uh, lead to um, trouble breathing and uh, respiratory failure. So there is no cure for cystic fibrosis. Um, and all of the problems are caused by mutations. Very often a single amino acid change in the gene called the CFTR. So since its discovery in, uh, in 1989, so many, many labs were pursuing to study, okay, how does CFTR uh, function? What's, how does it regulate? What regulates the function of the protein? Why a particular amino acid or mutation will cause terrible disease? So we included, have tried for many years without success, want to look at the molecule, the shape of the molecule to address these questions. The reason we couldn't succeed is because for many years we depended on technique called X-ray crystallography. So we basically purify the protein out of our cells and uh, try to grow, grow crystals out of it. The same kind of crystals like diamonds in our rings, but except that they are made of this particular protein. And uh, for, for whatever reason, CFTR cannot, no matter what we tried, it cannot grow crystals. So about four years ago, a technology breakthrough happened in the field. That, um, so a new a technology called the electron microscopy, you literally just look at the protein under the microscope. But those microscopes are made of electrons, are, are shine through electrons instead of light. So through this breakthrough, suddenly enable us to look at the proteins with this new technique. So Within a week of, of this was being public, Rockefeller just decided to make a commitment to build a new micro, uh, microscope uh, facility. So one of our trustees, um, uh, Evelyn Lipper, donated $10 million to, to make this happen. And because of this new technique, me and many others are able to suddenly solve structures like making breakthroughs in many, many projects we have been stuck for years. Just give you an idea, our, our peers like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford just recently installed their microscope. And we had four years to enjoy this new technique. And uh, one of the um, results is the structure of cystic fibrosis um, causing proteins called a uh, CFTR. So this is the shape of this molecule. I'm not going to bore you with. But what I want to show you is these little balls are the positions discovered in patients. Any a single change in one of these balls will cause disease. And I color them differently based on where they are. So we can see, for example, the purple ones are called the pore construction. Those are regions will let iron through. This is what this molecule does, let chloride iron through membranes. So you can imagine change in these purple balls will either block iron flow or change the rate iron will flow. And the other regions, like um, the red bars, are where the two parts of the protein communicate with each other. And the changes destroy the communication, sometimes will destroy the protein. The protein cannot form the correct shape at all, and sometimes will destroy the regulation of the protein when it's supposed to open or close. 
So this is just to give you a rough idea what we can learn from the shape of the molecule. So knowing what's wrong with each patient by looking at the where the mutation is will help us to design medicines, or personalize medicines, depends on the, the, the severeness of the disease. I think I just end here, I just want to point out, majority of the cystic fibrosis patient has a mutation at this position phenylalanine 508, it just deleted altogether. What does this molecule do? This particular amino acid is at the communication of the blue part and the green part. The blue part is the one that will interact with the ligand called the ATP, and this interaction will open the gate. And this, um, the, the green part here will penetrate to the membrane to form the pathway for the ion flow. So lock out this mutation, what happens is most of the patient, this molecule cannot even form this shape. Then what happens to these proteins, they are stuck inside the ER, eventually will become degraded. So if you look at the patients with this mutation, uh, they cannot even have C a CFTR on the cell surface. So completely lack of um, the functional protein and uh, lead to a devastating disease. So it's our hope by understanding what this molecule look like, how they function. Now we're looking at how the drugs interacting with the protein, we can design better drugs and eventually help our patients. So thank you, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Ju. Um, uh, you mentioned that there, not many years ago, there was this breakthrough in electron microscopy um, called cryo-EM, right? Um, could you talk about what the difference is between crystallography and what you're able to do? Yeah, very yeah. good. So, so uh, I mentioned crystallography. We have to purify the protein and pack them perfectly so they can form shiny crystals. Cryo-EM, we don't need to do that. So we'll keep the protein in solution where they are happy. And the cryo means very cold, right? So we, we basically freeze the protein so fast in, in uh, liquid ethane, so they will form what we call the vitreous ice. They're like glass-like ice, and they will basically freeze those molecules in ice, and then we look at them. So we don't freeze one copy of the protein, we freeze millions of them. And then we take uh, images. Every image is a two-dimensional picture, right? But if we take the protein in all kinds of conformations, we can eventually put all these two-dimensional images together to reconstruct the three dimensions. So it's a very powerful microscope in, th in the end, and you take millions of pictures at different angles. Eventually, you computationally put them together to form the three-dimensional structure. Thanks. Any questions at all about um, how this membrane channel yes. works? Yeah, let me, um, for the benefit of the people who aren't in the room, if you could. Well, could you talk a little bit about how you would apply this knowledge that you've, you've acquired, particularly about the most common F 508 mutation, yeah. what, what are the practical implications for patients? Okay, so very good question. So um, right now, Vertex has two drugs on the market that we call the correctors, can help folding of Delta 508 uh, mutations, uh, deletions. So we are now in pursuing how those drugs will interact with uh, the protein and uh, understand why will this particular drug help the Delta 508 mutations to, to, f to form the right correct structure. And those drugs are not perfect. They can only c correct a small percentage of the, uh, of the mutant. And also, this drug by itself is not sufficient to cure a patient. You have, to, uh, you have to, in combination with another drug, to activate the, the activity. So patients with this mutation are now gave a combination of e two or three different drugs at once. Some help correcting a percentage of molecule, some help making it active. So we want to study well, through cryo-EM to understand how those different drugs interact and activate the protein, and hopefully we can make it simple to find the, the ultimate goal is find one drug can do, can, can fix this mutation. We don't have to take three or four, three or two drugs at a time. This is just one of the applications we are working on. Any other questions? Yeah, I should mention, so CFTI is just one of the pumps we study. We also study two more pumps that involved in um, chemotherapy. Um, when, when you treat 
tumor cells with the drugs, they quickly becoming resistant, a lot of them becoming resistant to an array of different drugs. And uh, one of the reasons is a number of those molecular pumps get expressed uh, in those cells, and they will pump drugs out of the cell before it can reach the target. So we are studying how those um, drug pumps work and hopefully to regulate them. In that case, for CFTR, we want to activate the CFTR. For the drug pumps, we want to inhibit them during chemotherapy. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hi, thank you. Um, I wonder if you just expand a little bit yeah. on how you're using this technique to unpack uh, chemotherapy resistance. You mean the drug? Yeah. So, so that uh, we are, um, for, for again, for many, many years now, people are looking for drugs that will act, uh, uh, inhibit those pumps. And they, um, without, n not nothing went through clinical uh, trial for different reasons. So right now we study two of the drugs in pa drug pumps in parallel. We are focused on the basic research. At this point, we want to know what they look like, what activates them, and hopefully through that, we can find out the mechanism how to inhibit them. And uh, so we are still far from drug design in that, in that um, project. This is much further along, yeah. But the idea is if we understand the basic principle, what activate those pumps probably we can come up with ideas how to, how to counteract in that activation or lock them into an inhibited state, a, a non-functional state. Yeah. Sorry, it helps the people online. Uh, just to follow up to the last question, so is it no, are these drug pumps that are responsible for um, chemotherapy resistance, do they only arise on the cell surface in response to the chemo drug, so they're not normally there, and they're almost like uh, they're a response to the drug? Is that what you're saying? You no, know, it's a very good question. So we normally those pumps protect us. They are, uh, for example, they line up uh, in the what we call the blood-brain barrier in the in the particular cells that separates our central nervous system from from the blood. You imagine we have all kinds of toxic molecules floating in the blood and they want to, so those molecules actually protect our brain by pump, constantly pumping those um, molecules outside, preventing it going into the, into the brain. So, um, but doing chemotherapy treatment for reasons we don't quite understand, they normally, we normally express certain number of those pumps, but the when you treat them with drugs, suddenly they make much more. Uh, some cells, not all tumor cells, some tumor cells suddenly start to make a lot more of these pumps, probably in the protection res response, then they were becoming a problem causing drug resistance. Yeah. yeah, study the regulation is also a very important area to, to, to address uh, drug resistance. Thank you, Jim. Thanks very much. <laughs> uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Jean Laurent Casanova. Jean Laurent received his undergraduate and uh, doctoral degree from the Paris Pierre and Marie Curie University and his medical degree from the Paris Descartes University. He joined Rockefeller in 2008 and became a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator in 2014. He's an international member of the National Academy of Medicine and a foreign associate of the National Academy of Sciences. He's won many awards, including the Robert Koch Award and the Sanofi Institut Pasteur Award. Jean Laurent heads the St. Giles Laboratory of Human Genetics and Infectious Diseases, investigating mutations that increase people's vulnerability to staph infections, the flu, fungal infections, and others. His work exposing holes in the immune system could create new possibilities for molecular diagnosis and genetic counseling, as well as treatments. Jean Laurent. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending. So I'm a pediatrician and I tackle a very simple question which is that of the root cause of infectious diseases, infectious diseases of children, also adolescents uh, and, and adults, young adults in particular. So the problem that I'm interested in is shown here. I have plotted on the x-axis the case fatality ratio for infectious diseases and on the y-axis, the number of infectious agents. And what you see here 
is that for the vast majority of microbes you've heard of, viruses, bacteria, fungi, or parasites, only a small and typically a very small proportion of infected individuals suffer from life-threatening disease. And the reason why until the late 19th century, half of the children died of infectious disease before the age of 15 years is not so much because microbes are virulent, but it's because there are thousands of microbes. And even if you're not a, a field medalist in mathematics, you can understand that if you have thousands of microbes and each of them kills one in a thousand or one in 10,000 people, you end up losing half of a generation before the age of 15 years and life expectancy is 20 to 25 years. So we can take examples. TB and malaria are not endemic in New York, but you can take influenza. So essentially everybody's infected by influenza virus every year. And every 10 or 15 years, it's a pandemic influenza, which is a little bit more aggressive. Uh, but whether for seasonal influenza or pandemic influenza, you have one in 10,000, in the worst cases, one in a thousand kids, adolescents, or young adults who end up in the intensive care unit with a respiratory tube on a ventilator. That is, most individuals cope well with the influenza virus and only a few die or almost die uh, because, of the because of the viral infection. So that's the problem. The problem of what is the root cause of infectious diseases. Of course, you can say infectious diseases are caused by infectious agent, but it's a little bit like saying that peanut allergy is caused by the peanut, or saying that um, phenylketonuria is caused by phenylalanine. It is not caused by phenylalanine, but if you have a phenylalanine diet, you suffer from encephalopathy, whereas if you don't eat phenylalanine, well, essentially phenylketonuria is asymptomatic. So we see the infectious agent as a trigger, and we try to understand the root cause of severe infectious diseases. And we're testing a very simple idea that, in fact, severe infectious diseases are genetic disorders. And there are essentially two groups of infections, at least in our mind. The very few infections that run in families, like any genetic disorder you can think of, including cystic fibrosis, you know, as beautifully, elegantly uh, described by Drew. If the infection runs in family like an autosomal recessive, an autosomal dominant, or a nixlink link recessive trait, well, we hypothesized that uh, with a little luck, there would be genes and molecules underlying predisposition to infectious diseases. Now, these are rare cases. There are, to my knowledge, only five infectious diseases of mankind that literally segregate like a Mendelian trait. And I use here the word Mendelian in the strict sense of the term, that is a trait that is monogenic with complete penetrance. And of these five infections that are Mendelian, I'm just going to share two vignettes with you. Infections caused by Candida albicans, a fungus. In most individuals, these fungi can cause little lesions from time to time. They typically do not persist, they do not recur. But in some kids, adolescents, and adults, the infection by candida persists. It results in oral thrush, sometimes in esophageal uh, lesions, uh, lesions of the nails. It sounds benign, but it's life-threatening because for unclear reasons, these patients also develop cerebral aneurysms. And it runs in families. It really does. It's called chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. And over the years, we've discovered that these infections are actually caused by mutations, mutations that disrupt a very particular immunological circuit controlled by a cytokine knows, known as AL17. So chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis is a fungal infection that runs in family, and that is caused by mutations in this immunological circuit that you know, prevents these fungi to persist in mucosae and in the skin. A second type of infection that runs in families um, is caused by poorly virulent 
microbial species such as those found in tap water or sparkling water everywhere. There are hundreds of microbial species in our environment. They are typically harmless. However, in some families they cause disease. Disease can be localized or disseminated. It can be chronic, it can be acute, it comes in multiple colors. But clearly this very unusual type of infection runs in families. And over the last two decades, we've shown that these unusual infections are literally caused by genetic lesions that disrupt another immunological circuit, which is controlled by another cytokine, gamma interferon. And if you're born with too little gamma interferon or a poor response to gamma interferon, well then, you're going to be prone to these microbial infections uh, year after year. So these are two examples uh, of infectious diseases that run in family and that are caused by genetic mutations. They're Mendelian traits. But of course, as you know from your uh, personal and professional life, infections are not Mendelian traits. If infections in general were Mendelian traits, that would have been discovered 100 years ago and we wouldn't be discussing this matter here. Infections typically are sporadic. You have a child in the intensive care unit with influenza, another one with herpes simplex encephalitis, a third with TB, and I could go on. It can be staphylococcal disease, pneumococcal disease, pertussis, malaria, you name it. But they're sporadic. They don't run in families or occasionally. So the way we tackle this problem is we simply took a pencil and added vertical bars in these pedigrees. That is, we hypothesized that sporadic infectious diseases are monogenic, but not Mendelian. That is, there is a genetic basis, but in a given family, there may be two or more at-risk genetically affected individuals, only one of whom develops life-threatening infection. In genetics, that's called incomplete penetrance. And the mechanisms, of course, have to be deciphered, but before understanding incomplete penetrance, you need to discover the monogenic basis of disease. So that's the model we've tested for now two decades. And we've tested a variety of infections, viral, fungal, bacterial, and parasitic. And in short, for every single infection we've studied, we've discovered at least in some patients and families genetic lesions that we've shown to be causal. And I'm just going to discuss a couple of infectious diseases we've been particularly interested in. Here, because it's a nice transition with the microbial diseases I described earlier, is TB. Tuberculosis, as you know, has been historically perhaps the greatest um, medical problem and certainly the greatest infectious problem of mankind. The reality is that in endemic areas, Everybody inhales the agent of TB, but only less than one in a hundred will die of TB. So the question is why TB? Well, we've discovered uh, mutations in several genes that also uh, intervene in uh, controlling gamma interferon immunity, the same cytokine I mentioned earlier when I was referring to patients with clinical disease caused by poorly virulent microbial species, well, with, with this exploration of the syndrome I referred to earlier as a base camp, if you like, we've discovered related but different inborn errors that do not predispose to clinical disease by poorly virulent microbial species, but that are genetic causes of TB. And more recently, that's not yet published, We've discovered a genetic disorder of mankind, which is even more common than cystic fibrosis and hemochromatosis. This is not yet published, but we've discovered a genetic disorder that strikes one in 600 New Yorkers. And the phenotype is TB. is the most common autosomal recessive disorder of Europeans and people of European descent. And the phenotype is TB. So it's a monogenic, very common genetic cause of TB. We also study viral diseases and in particular infections of the brain, of the forebrain and of the hindbrain. And to cut a long story short, we've discovered that infections of the forebrain caused by a very common virus, which is herpes simplex virus, are due to mutations that disrupt the 
central nervous system autonomous cell intrinsic and cell autonomous control of herpes simplex virus. If you're born with mutations that make your neurons and oligodendrocytes not fully capable of controlling viruses and producing interferon, an antiviral molecule, then you develop herpes simplex encephalitis the day you're infected by herpes simplex virus. Now for the hindbrain, we've recently shown that it's a different genetic and immunological circuit that's involved. These are families in which the virus, not only herpes simplex, but also influenza or norovirus, the virus attack the hindbrain as opposed to the forebrain. And here, the mutations involved uh, are not in the TOL3 pathway. They are controlled by DBR1, which is yet another gene that controls a completely different uh, cell autonomous pathway. Now, I'm going to close this talk with flu, again, because I started discussing flu. We've shown that's a program we started recently when we moved to Rockefeller, and we've discovered two genetic etiologies of acute respiratory distress syndrome. Kids, you know, who are completely okay until the age of six or seven years, influenza, intensive care unit, respirator. And we've discovered that the severe flu in these kids is caused by mutations in RF7 or RF9, that's not yet been published, and these mutations disrupt cell autonomous control of the influenza virus in pulmonary tissues. So this is, uh, these are some of the little stories uh, that I've extracted from the work of our lab, and I'm happy to take questions if you have some. Thank you, Jean Laurent. Yes, and here, if you would just use the microphone. So, <coughs> excuse me, so what are the public health implications of this? What, how can this be used for public health? Right, so this is a very important question. The life expectancy at birth in 100 years you know, has improved from 20 years at birth to 80, 85. Thanks to hygiene, aseptic surgery, vaccination, and anti-infectious agents, okay? Now, we take it for granted that it's gonna go on, but if natural selection operates, and we know it does, by definition, in 550 or 500 years, the microbes we know will be resistant to all medications we have. And the likelihood that they become resistant faster than our capacity to develop new drugs is high, pretty high. So I think we have a window of opportunity to understand infectious diseases. If we understand the root cause of infectious diseases and if they're genetic, then we can treat infectious diseases not by hammering the microbe with an antibiotic, but by restoring the piece that's missing in the child or the adolescent or the young adult. And I have many examples for you. Uh, we treat patients with mycobacterial disease with gamma interferon because we know they don't make enough gamma interferon. It's like giving insulin to the diabetic patient. You know, you die of diabetes, you take insulin, well, you know, you're cured because insulin is lacking in the diabetic patient. You know, and once we know the component that is missing for each infectious disease and each patient, we can restore immunity. That is exactly the plan. Thank you, other questions? Yes. Thank you. I guess I was just curious if this was sort of a hypothesis driven discovery or if you did uh, went about sort of in more of an observational way, you saw this in the field and you said, oh, mycobacterium avium could be somehow associated with this recessive gene pattern? So it is hypothesis driven in the sense that we hypothesized infections to be genetic. Uh, this idea, I the idea is very ancient. Um, the first infectious disease ever described, La Flacherie by Pasteur, you know, the, the chapter on Flacherie is called Hereditary Flacherie. That is, Pasteur himself had noticed that the silkworms that were vulnerable to Flacherie were only silkworms of specific species. So then in the, at the turn of the 20th century, plant biologists had shown that infections of wheat were Mendelian also. So from 1910 to 1950, there's already compelling evidence, not molecular and cellular, but you know, compelling genetic evidence, if you like, that infections can be genetic across living organisms. So the idea was there. We hypothesized that this idea was correct 
and that they were genes and molecules and we discovered them. Um, this is obviously a very hypothetical question, but the kinds of mutations the kinds of vulnerabilities caused by the mutations that you're describing and that you're studying, I mean, say for instance in the case of flu, are these the sorts of things that would, I don't know, suggest gene editing solutions as a form of, I don't know, uh, inoculation? Yeah, this is another great question. So I was discussing with your colleague the possibility to use the recombinant molecule like insulin, but of course a more radical solution is gene therapy or even gene editing. Absolutely. You know, it is not something that can be easily down for now, but once we understand the genetic cause of infection, all of a sudden the research will focus on therapeutic options. Whether providing a molecule, you know, a gene or editing the gene, these are all possibilities for the future, absolutely. But the starting point has to be, you know, the discovery of the genetic lesions. Before you fix the engine, you need to know what's wrong. Another flu question. Uh, <coughs> do you know what percentage of like fatal flu cases are caused by the an identified genetic deficiency? So for flu, currently, is very small. The infection for which we have the best percentage or the highest percentage is herpes simplex encephalitis. For herpes simplex encephalitis, we now understand about 10% of the cases. The difficulty we're facing here is well known in genetics, although it's been historically neglected, is called genetic heterogeneity. And you will understand if you look around this table. Each living organism is unique. This is something that mathematicians and physicists typically don't understand. You know, you know, copies, you've all been distributed the same copies, but you're all different. The chairs are the same, but you're all different. So the determinism of health and disease operates fundamentally in unique individuals. In other words, there are no diseases. Diseases are words, they're jargon. They are only patients. So the biological reality is that the determinism operates within individuals. So for each infectious disease, or actually each phenotype you can think of, there will be almost by necessity, given the structure of living organisms, an enormous range of mutations. Uh, next we have Dr. Sid, Sid Strickland. Um, Sid graduated from Rhodes College before receiving his doctoral degree from the University of Michigan. He joined Rockefeller as a professor in 2000 and also serves as the Dean and Vice President for Educational Affairs here at the University. Sid leads the Patricia and John Rosenwald Laboratory of Neurobiology and Genetics. He studies how dysfunction of the blood clotting system in the brain contributes to neurological conditions such as Alzheimer's. His approach focusing on the vascular mechanisms of the disease could allow for earlier and better diagnosis and again, uh, point the way to new therapies. Sid, you have, are you wired? I'm wired. Very good. <laughs> it, it is good to be wired. In every way, I'm wired. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much for coming. It's a, it's a pleasure to talk to you today. Um, I'm not gonna give you the, the classic Alzheimer's introduction, I think everybody knows that, so I'm going to spare you that. And I think you all know how important it is and what a looming public health crisis it is. So if you take an Alzheimer's patient post-mortem or a living Alzheimer's patient and you examine their cerebrovascular function, blood vessels in the brain, they almost all have abnormalities. <coughs> it's greater than 85%. So what is, it, what is the importance of that? Um, is this an independent here, an independent comorbidity or something causal? So by independent comorbidity, I mean, if you look at Alzheimer's patients, most of them have joint problems. That's because they're elderly, their joints are giving out, but of course there's no real relation between those two. But is there a relationship between the something causal between the vascular system and Alzheimer's? So the evidence of that comes from something that's been set up very nicely from Jean Laurent, which is genetic evidence. So there are people that have 
autosomal dominant mutations that give them Alzheimer's. And these are, as, as Jean Laurent said, they're fully penetrant, so they're very Mendelian, which means that if you get one of these mutations, you invariably get early stage Alzheimer's. They're rare, but there's lit literally hundreds of these mutations. What this does is it gives us an opportunity to look at patients well before they de developed any kind of cognitive problem. Since you know at birth, with one of these mutations, that that kid will get Alzheimer's disease, and you, you pretty much know the age based on the cohort, maybe 50, maybe 45, you can follow them as a function of time and ask, what goes wrong first? And what goes wrong first, in most cases, is vascular abnormalities. So you see these decades before you've seen any cognitive problem. So what that suggests is the vascular system is somehow related to the development of Alzheimer's disease. So I'm going to talk mostly about how the molecules of Alzheimer's disease can cause vascular dysfunction, but at the end I'll talk about the opposite, how vascular dysfunction can possibly cause Alzheimer's disease. So this is what we've been working on. And if there's a causal relationship, what could it be? And we've been working on, as, as Frank said, on the bl blood clotting system. Just a tiny bit of introduction. Fibrin is the major component of blood clots. So if you get a blood clot, and we've all had blood clots, then that, that macromolecular thing you see, the protein that's in there is a protein called fibrin. And if you look in Alzheimer's patients in their brains, they almost all have increased fibrin deposition in the brain. So there's evidence of increased clotting in these patients. So there's really two reasons for more fibrin in the brain. One is maybe you make fibrin and you can't get rid of it. That would lead to more fibrin accumulating. Or more fibrin is made. So I'm going to address these both in turn. So what about less fibrin is, is degraded? If you make a clot, if you take fibrin and you make a clot and you look at it in a scanning EM, this is what it looks at like. There are these pretty regular cables. Those are cables of fibrin. That's what makes up the, the meshwork of the clot that prevents bleeding. And these clots are, are structurally sound, but there's a system in the body to get rid of them. So they're easily degraded. So they form, and then they're easily degraded subsequent to their formation. If you take this Alzheimer's disease peptide, A-beta, many of you have probably heard of A-beta. It's the little peptide that's a major component of Alzheimer's plaques in the brain, and it's been shown genetically that it is at least one driver of Alzheimer's disease. It's a small peptide. If you just make a clot in the presence of this peptide, you can see that the clot structure is grossly distorted. It's a very abnormal structure. So that's kind of interesting, but what's much more interesting is this clot is extremely resistant to degradation. So if you get a clot in the presence of A-beta, you basically can't get rid of it. And I'll tell you the consequences of that in a few minutes. So less fibrin is degraded in Alzheimer's patients. What about is more fibrin made? We have looked at it, what's a secondary clotting pathway. I won't, I won't subject you to the clotting cascade. It's extraordinarily complex, and it would, would, it would put all of you to sleep. But there is a, a secondary clotting pathway called the intrinsic clotting system. And what's different about this than the primary clotting system, the primary clotting system, if you have a defect, then you have hemophilia. You bleed. But the secondary clotting system, if you, if you knock it out, you don't bleed. So its, it's exact function in clotting is not 100% sure, but it exists and it's important. So one thing we have found is that if you look in Alzheimer's patients, in their plasma, you can get evidence for activation of this intrinsic clotting system. And that's very important because what the holy grail, of course, of diagnosis for something like Alzheimer's is plasma-based detection because it's non-invasive and you can do it easily and cheaply, et cetera. So we can look at Alzheimer's patients and we can show that the great majority of them have activation of this intrinsic clotting system. But you'd like to really like to know, is that actually a causation of a disease or maybe that's just a, a consequence of people having Alzheimer's disease? So for that, we turn to mouse experiments. There are mice, Alzheimer's disease mice, that recapitulate a lot of the, the, the symptoms of, of, 
80 patients. If you look at 80 mice, they have more fibrin deposition in the brain because they're getting, they're getting activation of this clotting system. They have much more brain inflammation. I'll have a little more to say about that. Neurons die. And of course, that's what really, in the end, causes people to have cognitive dysfunction. They're losing the, the business end of the brain, and their memory is decreased. So to study whether these 80 mice, is, is the intrinsic clotting system is related, we can knock out the intrinsic clotting system. As I said, if you knock it out, people or mice don't bleed. They, they can tolerate this very well. So we can take an Alzheimer's disease mouse, we can knock out the intrinsic clotting system and ask what happens. And if you do that, all of these symptoms are improved. They have less fibrin deposition because they have less clotting. They have much less brain inflammation, which I think is extremely important, less neuronal death, and their memory is also preserved. So um, here is a working model that incorporates all of this, these ideas. That in a non-diseased state, you have a normal clot. The clot can form when it's needed, and then it can be degraded and gotten rid of. In an Alzheimer's patient where you have an increase of this A-beta peptide, you first of all activate a clotting system, which gives you more clots in the brain, and the clots that you form in the presence of A-beta are abnormal and difficult to degrade, and so you get reduced degradation, more abnormal clot, reduced degradation. When you think of, of clots, in, inappropriate clots, the, your mind immediately thinks of, of occlusion. That's what almost everybody thinks of. You think of a clot forming in a blood vessel, the blood being interrupted, the blood flow being interrupted, and therefore the downstream cells dying of starvation of oxygen and nutrients. And that does happen. That's, of course, what happens in ischemic stroke or, ischem or heart attacks. Um, happened. Oh. Um, but there's another component of fibrin deposition, which I think is equally and probably more important, and that's inflammation. Now, you all know that fibrin causes inflammation. And how do you know? When you cut yourself, you form a scab, and a couple of days later, it gets red around that scab and starts to itch a lot. That is the fibrin molecule recruiting white blood cells into the area to clean up the mess. And that's a good thing. You want to clean up the mess. So you can imagine what happens if you form a clot and you can't get rid of it. Now the fibrin molecule is recruiting inflammatory cells all the time, all the time. You get a chronic in inflammatory situation and you can get, you can get cell death. <coughs> so our idea is that Alzheimer's is a very complex disease. Um, the idea that you're going to have a magic bullet for Alzheimer's disease is, is just as silly as what used to be thought of as a magic bullet for cancer. People thought you were going to get a molecule going to cure all cancers. Of course, that's, that's really naive today. Alzheimer's, we think, is going to be the same way. So what are the advantages of these, this work? Well, we think that one of the advantages is that you would be able to stratify patients that come in, say patients that come in with cognitive decline. You could take their blood and ask, is the clotting system activated, or do they have fibrin deposition? And if they do, if they belong to that subset of patients, you could intervene in those clotting systems, reduce fibrin, reduce inflammation, and hopefully have a beneficial effect of the outcome of the disease. And we've shown that in mice, as I've shown you, and in many other situations. Now, one other thing just, uh, I just saw this morning, um, um, which is this idea of vascular dysfunction I've said that the molecules of Alzheimer's disease can drive vascular dysfunction, clotting, but vascular dysfunction can it drive AD. So there was just a, a paper published, I haven't read the paper, I've just read the, the news reports uh, in Sweden, looking at women that were fit, very fit, medium fit, and not fit at all. And it turns out the very fit cohort is extremely protected against dementia, extremely protected. They have 90% less dementia than the, the most unfit. The, the nice things about the study, it was long term, it was 44 years, they followed these women. It's a small cohort, but it fits in with the idea that exercise is protective. And how can that be? Well, it's not our work, but people have shown that if you increase vascular fitness, 
you can decrease the amount of A-beta peptide made. So that means that the A-beta peptide can drive vascular dysfunction. If you improve vascular dysfunction, you can actually decrease the amount of A-beta made. So we think that, um, that this vascular connection to Alzheimer's is an important component. It's not the only component, it's an ad component. And we think that by further study and looking at it, we may be able to have beneficial effects on the patients. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sid. Um, questions? I was intrigued by the, um, the, the driver of inflammation, the fact that if you can't clear these, these fibrin deposits, the clotting, that uh, it'll set you into a chronic yeah. infl inflammatory state. Which People have made mice that you, where you, they can't get rid of fibrin, and it's interesting. They're born completely normal, and they live a completely normal um, life for about six months and then they start to waste and then they all die. And if you ask why they die if they can't get rid of fibrin, it's not that they have heart attacks and strokes, it's they have chronic body-wide inflammation which kills, kills them. Mm -hmm. um, question over here. Hi. Hi. Um, so if it's the presence of the amyloid beta that's uh, triggering the, this, uh, abnormal intrinsic clotting system. Mm -hmm. You said that you can, that in mice, you're able to um, reduce that, you're able to modify that intrinsic system right. and get a positive result. Right. But how are you doing that? Because presumably the amyloid beta is still there. And, and also, how would exercise, mm -hmm. in the case of the Swedish study, uh -huh. how would that alter the system if, if if the triggering uh, factor is amyloid beta? Well, they're not, they're not all the same mechanism. So th the, the first question is that you can, you can knock out the, the intrinsic clotting system by various techniques in mice. And the idea there is that now you don't have this component of the disease. You don't have the clotting component of the disease. You still have A beta being made. So that, you know, if, you, if you step back and think most generally, how can you approach Alzheimer's? If A beta is a an important thing, there's various things you can do. You can keep it from being made, A beta. You can get rid of it what by once it's made, and that's been there's been a lot of clinical trials using antibodies against A beta to try to clear it. Or you can prevent its action downstream of whatever it's doing. And that's kind of what we're, we're looking at. We're looking at what it's doing downstream. So that doesn't, you're very right, it doesn't get at the core feature that you still have too much A-beta being made. But it does prevent at least one of its pathological consequences, we think. The exercise is a kind of a different situation. It's not necessarily related to the clotting system, we don't know, but it's just been shown that as if, if my in mice, that if the, if the vascular system is m healthier, then you have less A-beta. If it's unhealthy, you have more A-beta. So we think that that's just, I think what, we're, what you're kind of getting to is what we believe too. It's, it's very complex. There are gonna be a lots of different vascular mechanisms and uh, we just need to tease them out, just like you do in cancer. You, you take a patient, you do like a breast cancer patient and ask, do th are they hormone receptor positive? Are they HER2, uh, HER2 positive? And then you design a therapeutic strategy based on their signature disease. And I think that's really what we need to do here. We, uh, our next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Eric Jarvis. Uh, Eric studied at Hunter College before receiving his doctoral degree from Rockefeller. He became a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator in 2008 and rejoined Rockefeller as professor in 2016. He was named one of the Brilliant Ten by Popular Science Magazine, among other recognitions for his work. Um, Eric heads the labor laboratory of neurogenetics of language using song learning birds to understand the neural and genetic mechanisms that underlie how humans learn language and how this complex behavior evolved. Today he will also tell you about an effort he is leading to generate the DNA sequences of all vertebrate species. All right, thank you. <coughs> so is this microphone okay? Great. Uh, well I want to thank Frank for in, uh, inviting me here to talk to the folks today and uh, we're really excited about what uh, we're working on now and uh, where we're coming from in terms of the uh, work we've done. And so uh, 
So yes, my lab has now two focuses to it that are merging together, and I've titled the, the names of those labs here on campus, uh, the Neurogenetics of Language Lab and the Vertebrate Genomes Lab, which is co-directed by uh, Olivier Fadrigo here. And um, my main passion in life has been to understand how the brain controls complex behaviors, uh, and the behavior that I chose to study most was uh, spoken language, or really vocal production learning, a specialized trait necessary for spoken language. I thought it was complex enough and uh, that it was mysterious enough to, to try to solve, but not as bad as trying to understand consciousness or love. So, uh, <coughs> uh, and uh, one of the reasons why is that this rare trait that it ha gives me this ability to produce the imitated sounds that I'm doing now is not only present in us, but is present in a few other species, a few other mammals besides humans, like dolphins, whales, bats, elephants, and seals. Also present in three groups of birds, parrots, songbirds, and hummingbirds. And even the word parrot in our everyday human uh, language has become synonymous with mimicry uh, for, for those who, um, some species who can imitate our own speech. All of these species have close relatives that don't learn how to produce imitated sounds, like chimpanzees for humans or falcons for parrots. And so what we have been doing is uh, comparing the behavior of all these species with other kinds of behaviors that are more ubiquitous, but we humans don't appreciate that that's necessary for language, but not sufficient. An example is auditory learning. Uh, your common pet animals, like dogs, can understand the word sit, or siente se in Spanish, osuari in Japanese, come here boy, get the newspaper. These are human words that the dog doesn't automatically know how to understand when it's uh, born. Uh, so a dog can't say, okay, you got it, I will sit. Instead, a dog goes woof, right? and sets these innate uh, uh, sounds in particular contexts. Uh, we call that vocal usage learning, but it's different from the ability to produce sounds. So <coughs> my lab and many other labs have been analyzing the genomes of these species to try to get at the genetics of language uh, and this particular substrate of language, vocal production learning. And in 2014, we sequenced a bunch of bird genomes, 48 species across the family tree, and use those genomes, compare genes, regulate it in what we and others have identified as specialized brain circuits, highlighted in the light green and uh, pink here, that control the ability to imitate sounds, cannot be found in chicken, but we can find these also in humans, but not non-human primates. And we found that uh, the molecular profiles of these regions in these songbirds and parrot brains corresponded with hundreds of genes to the molecular profiles, the speech areas of the human brain. Uh, which then allowed us to now use songbirds as a model to study the basic biology of spoken language, but also uh, certain disorders as associated with language, like speech sound disorder or autistic uh, deficits uh, more recent that are associated with speech. More recently, in trying to start manipulating the genes we discovered shared between songbirds and humans, we've been looking at the mouse brain, a non-vocal learner, but it turns out that it actually has some abilities very rudimentary abilities to produce some interesting kind of sounds, and this is what it sounds like. I'm going to play for you a mouse ultrasonic song pitched down to our hearing range. It sounds like a songbird, but it actually is uh, mostly innate. And what we're trying to do now for our future experiments is take these genes that cause the development, we think, of these specialized circuits in songbirds and humans for speech and put them in a mouse brain. We're, we're not there yet in terms of getting these mice to uh, modify their vocalizations in the way songbirds do, but that's one of the future goals. Uh, and we are uh, publishing particular stages in that path. To get at <coughs> those genes that we discovered, we realized the power of genomics. Uh, and as a result of me co-leading this effort on these bird genomes, I've been voted in as chair of a new organization called, well, an old organization called the uh, G10K group, but we started a new project called the Vertebrate Genomes Project. And we got very ambitious. Instead of 10,000 genomes in the G10K project, uh, we're going to do all vertebrate species, uh, all 66,000 species on the planet. Uh, and we have a plan, but, but we don't necessarily have the funds. And I'll tell you how the funds for phase one, actually phase one we do. Rockefeller helped us start this vertebrate genomes lab on campus, so Rockefeller is serving as a central hub for this project. We're going to do first 260 orders in phase one, representing all orders of vertebrates, including some that are almost going extinct. Uh, 
If we get to 10,000 species, we'll reach what we call the G10K milestone. And then for all species, for all, we'll reach all 10,000 birds, 1,000 bats, and so forth. Um, a lesson we learned back in 2014 is that the current genome technology generates what we call Swiss cheese genomes. They have lots of holes in them. They use very short reads. And for those who, under who uh, understand genomics, what you do is you sequence little pieces of the genome, and then you assemble them like a puzzle. And the Swiss cheese genomes have all these little holes in it and misassemblies and errors. And this causes scientists that make many mistakes that they don't even realize they're making, including with the human genome, all right? Uh, so for three years, we worked with all the major sequencing companies and developed their own technologies as well and came up with an uh, approach that is generating a much higher quality, what we're calling platinum quality reference genomes. And the read length or the distance is like if this were the, t the height of a man or a p person here, uh, we're now using packed biosequencing, which is like the height of the Empire State Building, and long-range chromosomal interactions to get chromosomal scale scaffolds, as we call them, for genome assemblies, like uh, going from the Earth to the Moon, uh, as an analogy. And if you have bigger puzzles, that you're, pieces of the puzzle that you're working with, you can get a more accurate uh, genome assembly. So as of, uh, <coughs> we started April, and as of this coming May, we're going to announce uh, the first 16 species released from this project, uh, and Rockefeller is coordinating the uh, press effort for that. It's an international effort involving uh, institutions in China, uh, Europe, uh, Brazil, and so forth. And uh, in this phase one, these numbers here represent the 260 species, or the breakdown of the 260 species. We're releasing 16 of them that represent all five major vertebrate groups. And we're releasing them publicly for the scientific community to use even before we publish a major uh, study on these 260 species. Um, <coughs> uh, so that we can uh, get the word out, so that we can uh, allow people to do better science. And also, we believe it's going to help us uh, gain public buy-in to raise the several hundred million that we need to do all 66,000 species. Uh, <coughs> and. Uh, our funding, uh, well, this is, I'm going to just thank NIH and other institutes, Rockefeller for my past funding and even current funding from Howard Hughes and, and Rockefeller. But for this first phase, I d we did reach out to the major funding institutes in the federal government and some private agencies. And yes, we got some support to build the infrastructure, but not really support to actually generate these genomes. So for this phase one, we have been funding these species by crowdfunding amongst scientists. Uh, they realized the value of these high-quality genome assemblies. We negotiated agreements with sequencing companies to drive down the costs, and that is causing a lot of scientists to flock to us to form this international consortium that is now over 200 people contributing uh, to this. Uh, so I will go ahead and stop there and take questions. Thanks, Eric. Yes. That's a, a terrific snapshot of a very complicated project. Yes. <laughs> Um, questions, anyone? Did I leave people speechless? <laughs> Don't be daunted. <laughs> <laughs> we all want to add to that just because you received some support. So. Yes. Yes, so, um, so we're, Sorry. that's, no, that's good. So we're, so the question is, for those who may not have heard it online, is that uh, everybody wants to ask about the 16 species that we're going to release in May. And uh, right now, we're not saying exactly what those species are, but, uh, in terms of categories, they will represent, you know, several birds, several mammals, several fish, reptiles, and so on. Uh, and they will include uh, highly endangered species. They'll include some vocal learners. Uh, and they will include some iconic species that everybody loves. Right. <laughs> Charismatic megafauna. Yes, right. OK, right. <laughs> but, uh, and and th these, these will, uh, the, you know, and it's not just for show and tell kind of species, but it, they, they will be v valuable for scientific research, like our vocal learning species. Yes. Uh, uh, hang on. Just let me. Yes. Okay. That hang on. Hang on. If for the online people, yeah. and, uh, and I'll paraphrase if you don't get if you want to ask. You know. And I've been asked if you would just please introduce yourself to the audience. Oh, yeah. um, this is Claudia Wallace. I write for Scientific American. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I really wanted to, you said something very quickly and it sort of stunned me, so I wanted to ask you about that. Did I understand you to say that you're look at that in mice who have this very rudimentary ability to produce for vocal production, yes. learning, you're looking at modifying mice genetically with songbird genes? That's right. And can you talk a little bit about <laughs> that, where that That's stands? That's what I said, yes. It's kind of mind-blowing idea and what you're hoping to learn from this. Yeah, so, um, <coughs> so, so the answer is yes. So, so there are two parts to that. Originally, we and the scientific community broadly had been assuming that language-like behaviors is black or white. You have it or you don't. All right. So the first thing we found is that uh, it's more of a continuum. That our, we think mice are partly there uh, with some ability to have uh, vocal modifications voluntarily, uh, like we do for speech, but it's still much more rudimentary compared to a songbird or a human. And uh, we found these genetic differences of genes, activity in the brain either increased or decreased regulation of certain genes that form connections from the forebrain to the neurons that control the voice. That is really robust in humans and songbirds and very weak in these mice. So what we're doing is taking the human version of those genes and putting them in the mouse brain, so to speak, uh, to try to enhance, like dial up the, the, uh, the light, really, for those connections and enhance that connectivity in the mouse brain uh, to become more like a songbird in a human. Uh, so that, and our prediction is that if we can do that, uh, we will get the mouse to have a greater voluntarily control and maybe imitation of vocalizations. Uh, <coughs> yeah. And, and yes, we'd like to do this, we, we're going to do the human genes in the mouse because it's a mammal and then songbird genes in a quail or a chicken. Great. So, yeah. And uh, it's, it's something we've been working on a while uh, in terms of a hypothesis. It's the, uh, the continuum idea is recent. Uh, but the fact, the, the idea to do this is what I proposed in my Howard Hughes uh, uh, project a number of years ago. Uh, but it was really, we were, we were far away from that goal now, I mean, back then, you know, five, eight years ago. But in this time period, with all these genomes, we identify candidate genes to manipulate. At the time we first proposed this, we had zero genes to work with. Uh, yeah, we're, we're first trying to do in juveniles, so local uh, genetic manipulations in the brain. Uh, and then if that works, then we'll create a transgenic animal with the human version of the gene. Or, or the set of genes that we see that differ. I, an, I, another remarkable aspect of this project, you know, your question makes me realize, realize is, you know, everybody's here, not everybody, but a lot of the folks want to know about the basic biomedical relevance of what we're doing. And yes, we, we, there are certain of these genes we've discovered that a conversion between songbird and humans when mutated cause speech deficits in humans. But what's equally as remarkable is the fact that over a 65 million year period of time, multiple species have converged onto the same genetic changes that are separated 300 million years from a common ancestor, like between humans and parrots. The same, the same, not only one or two, but many dozens of genes in different brain areas are convergent in their, gen, uh, their genetic makeup. And how that happens is a mystery. You know. And when we published this, some said it, it proves intelligent design. But uh, we, we don't think if that's the case. We just haven't figured out how you get that. But I, th I like to think of it like evolution of wings. You have upper limbs here in bats and birds. The wings evolved here because it's the most energetic way to fly uh, at the center of gravity of the body. There's something like that in the, in, the, in the human brain, and maybe it's a motor learning circuit out of which these pathways evolve. So, sorry, that's a long answer, but I hope it's... it's uh, uh, Lee Hotz, Wall Street Journal. Um, but I'd like you to continue that answer. So are you suggesting this is an example of something that's evolved independently in, uh, or something that's just evolved from a common ancestor's trait that you haven't figured out yet? Uh, I think it's evolved independently, but what from a what we call a deep homology, 
uh, uh, ancestral condition, okay? And what does that mean? Uh, we've, we've found that uh, songbirds, parrots, hummingbirds, and we think the bats as well, you know, the other vocal learners, that the vocal learning pathway that controls our speech ability is embedded in a motor learning pathway that controls my ability to do sign language, learning how to walk, learning how to play piano, and so forth. And this signing ability that I'm just doing now, actually with speech, right? Uh, and it actually happens naturally. People think it's connected evolutionarily. Uh, that exists in non-human primates. That exists in chickens, you know, gesturing, learn gestures. And so what we think happened, our hypothesis is that this motor learning pathway that controls my ability to learn how to walk, dance, and so forth, gave rise to a whole brain pathway duplication that now controls the vocal organs and the tongue and the, and the jaw. And we're basically talking like as if we're learning how to dance, so to, so to speak. And the deep homology is the motor learning circuit that all vertebrates have. The independent evolution is the specific speech circuit that independently came about in parrots and songbirds and humans. Next up, we have Dr. Vince Fischetti. Uh, Vince studied at Wagner College and Long Island University before receiving his doctoral degree from New York University. He joined Rockefeller's faculty in 1973 and has received the National Institutes of Health Merit Award, among other honors. Vince heads the Laboratory of Bacterial Pathogenesis and Immunology. He develops new ways to treat bacterial infections, including those resistant to current an antibiotics, by employing methods evolved by bacteria-killing viruses. Today, he will discuss a new type of drug based on lysins, molecules that viruses use to break open bacterial cells. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here to tell you about some of the technology that we've developed over the, uh, I guess, many years uh, that we've been working on uh, bacterial infections. Um, we're at a point now where antibiotic resistance is a serious problem. Uh, it's, it's been like this for a, probably a couple of decades, but it's gotten worse. Um, Organisms are available in hospitals, in the community, that are resistant to multi drugs, multiple drugs, uh, extreme drug resistant organisms, organisms in that are resistant to every known antibiotic that we can throw at them. So uh, we need to develop new uh, alternatives to these conventional antibiotics. Uh, it's estimated that by 2050, more people will die. Of, of these infectious diseases than uh, cancer. So uh, controlling these organisms is a real challenge. And we've taken the phage license is an enzyme that's produced by bacteriophage. Bacteriophage are viruses that infect bacteria. Uh, in fact, um, every two days, half the bacteria on Earth are killed by bacteriophage. So it's an it's a, it's a, uh, optimal killing um, uh, enzyme. So this is a gram-positive organism, just to give you an idea what phage lysins are. It's a gram-positive organism. This is the cell wall. Here's the membrane. A bacteriophage is a virus that has specific receptors on its tail that interact with uh, ligands on the cell wall. When those ligands interact, the phage inject their DNA into the host cell. And once that DNA, oops, sorry. Oops. OK, start again. Once the, uh, once the DNA gets into the host cell, it takes over the cell for the production of new virus particles. Once those virus particles are assembled, the phage have a problem. They need to get out of this organism. And they solve the problem by producing an enzyme, a lysin. And that lysin goes through the membrane, producing a, they produce a holin that allows it to go through the membrane. And when it interacts with the cell wall, it cleaves the bonds in the cell wall. And since the pressure inside the bacteria is greater than the external environment, the membrane externalizes, explodes, releasing the phage in the environment for another infectious cycle. This cycle is phage, what's called phage therapy. But what we've done is purify the enzyme. We make all our enzymes recombinantly. And if you take that purified enzyme and add it externally to a gram-positive organism, it does precisely what it does from the inside. It drills a hole in the cell wall allowing the membrane to externalize, killing the organism virtually instantly. Works very, very rapidly and very efficient. These enzymes have evolved over a billion years, so there's a billion years of, of evolution, and they have to work for the phage. If, the, if this enzyme doesn't work, the, the phage progeny will not get out, and therefore that's the end of that phage. So it's, it's a very efficient enzyme for kill. 
So just to give you an idea, this is a bacillus anthracis. This is a normal uh, uh, ele uh, electron micrograph of the organism. Here's after treatment with one, mi one uh, minute with lysine. You can see the cell wall is collapsed, basically. It's, it's in a sense like taking a balloon, punching a hole in a balloon, it just collapses down. And I'll show you in basically in real time how this occurs. What we've done here is taken the anthrax organism, put it under a cover slip, and then added the enzyme at the edge of that cover slip. And as the enzyme comes in, it'll start killing the organisms. Uh, if you follow any organism, it will happen very quickly. If you just follow this guy in the beginning, you'll see the membrane externalizing, and then it'll, it'll disappear. There we go. So this is basically real time. So that quickly is it works. It's a very efficient enzyme. The more enzyme you add, the faster it goes. So it's an extremely uh, efficient system. So we've, over the years, we've developed license against a number of gram-positive and gram-negative organisms and tested it in a number of animal models to prove that you can actually use this in a variety of, of ways in which antibiotics are used. So right now, we can take a license and treat them uh, systemically, topically, uh, intravenously, whatever. Uh, if you use an antibiotic for that purpose, you can use a lysine for the same purpose, to, to kill the organisms. Um, just to compare phage lysins with whole phage, uh, we don't see resistance with phage lysins. We've, we've been working on this for about 15 years, and we've see, we have not seen resistance. No one has ever seen resistance. So that's an advantage uh, to, um, uh, to this type of technology, whereas phage, uh, resistance to phage is, is, by bacteria, very, very high. Uh, drug complexity, this is a pure substance compared to to whole phage, whole phage, in order for whole phage to work as a, as a means to kill bacteria, you have to make a cocktail of several phage. Because of the resistance issue, you have to make a cocktail. So it's a, a very complex mixture in order for phage therapy to work. Lot to lot homogeneity is here you're dealing with, with a consistent single purified material, whereas in using whole phage and you're dealing with mixtures, they're going to have difficulties. Uh, intellectual property, all our, pat all our, uh, pat our uh, license are patented. Uh, for, whole for phage therapy, there's no proprietary mix. You could make a mix of phage to kill a particular organism. I could make a, a mix of different phage to, to, cr to uh, accomplish the same thing. So there's nothing proprietary about phage therapy. Immunogenicity, antibodies do not neutralize the enzyme. These are proteins. And one of the problems we thought we would have is that that people would make antibodies to these enzymes and that would neutralize their effects. But we found that, that antibodies to these lysins do not neutralize their effects. So you can use it in a chronic situation. For example, to decolonize pneumococci in a nursing home. You can use the lysin to remove the pneumococci from the, from the oral cavity of, of people in nursing home to prevent pneumonia. Uh, whole phage, uh, are, they are neutral. Antibodies are neutralizing. Uh, the universal treatment, these lysins are, are very broad in their activity. The, in in one, one strain that we test, one lysin we've tested against staphylococci, tested more than a thousand strains throughout the world, and it kills all of them. So it's very, very broad in its activity. Whereas here, uh, with phage therapy, it depends on the complexity of the mix, whether you can cover a large number of organisms. Uh, allergic response, we have not seen it in phase one, and we don't know in, uh, about phase therapy. It hasn't gotten that far. In, in the system. And, and endotoxin, uh, very little endotoxin, because you, again, you're dealing with a purified material. Uh, this may be a difficult thing to control in phage therapy. So I think f license could be a, a, the future and, and the way in which we can use, what we can control uh, uh, these organisms. We have two enzymes, one in clinical trials right now, as Contrafect uh, is using the lysin for uh, MRSA infections in hospitals. Phase one was completed several months ago. They just began and started on phase two. Um, it's it's going to be treating MRSA bacteremia, sepsis, and endocarditis in the hospital. And BioHarmony is uh, 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 developing an acetobacter baumannii lysin. Uh, burn patients get uh, these types of infections very commonly. They are multi-drug resistance, the acetobacter, very dangerous organism. And this will be used as a topical spray to control the organisms in these individuals. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Um, 
at one point you were comparing what the license to phage therapy, and I don't know if every, everyone knows what that is. What is phage therapy? Well, what phage therapy is using phage to kill bacteria. It, it, phage therapy started before antibiotics started. They were discovered well before antibiotics started. And in fact, they were, uh, Pfizer was starting a, a plant in Brooklyn to, to produce phage for phage therapy uh, until antibiotics were discovered, and then they stopped it. It was around the early 1940s. So phage therapy is a, is a possible approach to control these types of organisms, but it has its issues. Not that it won't work, but it, it has issues, as I, as I described. Um, yeah. And again, if you would introduce yourself. Yeah. I'm Malcolm Ritter from the Associated Press. Is there any reason to think that bacteria won't become resistant to this, too? We've tested very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult for them to become resistant to to lysins. They have to re remodel their cell wall, and it's very difficult for them to do that. I'm not saying it's it'll never happen, but it's much rarer than antibiotic resistance. When you compare it on a one-to-one -one basis, uh, uh, compare antibiotic resistance, you get it at a frequency a tenth of the minus eighth, tenth of the minus ninth, maybe up to tenth of the minus tenth. This is well beyond that frequency. Again, not to say that it won't happen, it, will, it just buys us much more time. It'll be very long before they, they become resistant. And never say never with bacteria. <laughs> Jeremy Shatton from New York Genome Center. I'm wondering if there's kind of a timeline for wide or broad adoption of, the, of this kind of you know, therapy in terms of that 50-year timeline of more people dying from bacterial infections than cancer, are we on track at all to head that, head that off? We're moving this? too slowly, as far yeah. as I'm concerned. We've known about this for years, and we're just moving very, very slowly. What do you attribute that? Uh, I think it's a matter of funding. I think it's the fact that antibiotics, everyone is comfortable with antibiotics. We all grew up with antibiotics, and, ev we want, and everyone wants to stay with antibiotics. But they've learned the trick. They know how to become resistant to antibiotics. So these alternative approaches are just not being taken up by the companies. They're sort of, it took me a long time speaking to these companies. When we discovered this about 19 years ago, it just took a long time for them. They, they always found the problem. They always found the problem, but it works. They just, they want to stay with what they are comfortable with. And the, one of the biggest issues in the beginning was these enzymes are targeted killing. So they only kill the organism you want to kill. Like pneumococcal enzyme will kill pneumococci. The staphylococcal enzyme kills staphylococci. Antibiotics kill everything. So when I, when I talked to these companies early on, they would say, oh, well, you know, it, it, it's too narrow spectrum. Well, now narrow spectrum drugs are, are the thing. You don't want to use broad spectrum antibiotics because of the problems with we see difficile issues and, and intestinal problems. So uh, it's changing. It's just taken a long time for it to, to change. And the, the importance of it, people are dying. Claudia Wallace, um, can you tell me, um, are you seeing any negative effects, side effects of any kind in the systems in which you're testing this, which I guess is mouse and now human? Um, do you see anything? No. The only we've in, in all our mouse studies, and other people have done this, uh, we've been doing, as I said, doing it for almost 20 years. Uh, other people have picked up on the technology and are doing it in their own labs. Never seen anything uh, of any major concern and any, any adverse events. In the phase one, there were no adverse events at all. It's just a protein. And the protein has a specificity for tar a target in the bacterial cell wall. We don't have those targets in mammalian tissue. So it's unlikely that we'll, we'll have any major issues with, uh, with these, these uh, lysins. We haven't, it's, I mean, it sounds too good to be true. It does. I agree with you. I get embarrassed sometimes when you talk about it because you don't see resistance and, y and you know, it but it, it is what it is. It is what it is. Peter Smith. Um, yeah, I guess I was just curious. This is also active against uh, gram-negative bacteria? So, yeah, right now we, we basically developed all license against uh, gram-positives initially because those are more accessible from the outside, the cell wall, whereas the gram-negatives have an outer membrane. 
and that prevents the, a protein like a lysin to go through that outer membrane to hit the peptidoglycan and cleave the wall so it explodes. So peptidoglycan is, is the meshwork that holds the pressure inside that organism. So uh, we're now working on the gram negatives. We, our first one was the acinetobacter. We now have a pseudomonas enzyme and, a, and an enterobacter, and as well as uh, uh, Klebsiella. So you have three of the enzymes against the major uh, gram negative pathogens that work f quite well, but our problem is that they don't work systemically. They work topically. This, uh, because of the, these enzymes require a highly charged region to get through the outer membrane, to dis disrupt the outer membrane, that charged region binds to albumin in serum and therefore it gets pulled out of solution. So we can use the one, the, the acinetobacter enzyme is being used for burn patients, but to use this systemically, we have to start engineering it. And we're working on trying to engineer them so they can not be absorbed out onto uh, 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 mammalian proteins. It's the, that's the big challenge, the gram-negative enzymes. But some of them work. Great. Um, so um, we've now uh, we've been joined by Dr. Michael Young. Uh, Mike received his undergraduate and doctoral degree from the University of Texas Austin, and joined Rockefeller's faculty in 1978. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and has been honored with many awards, including last year's Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, shared with uh, two scientists at Brandeis. Mike heads the Laboratory of Genetics, studying the genetic regulation of biological clocks. His recent work is focused on a mutation that prolongs circadian rhythms, making it difficult for those affected to stay on a normal 24-hour cycle. His research has implications for understanding sleep, mood disorders, and also uh, the mechanisms behind jet lag. Mike. Yeah, I thought I, I was coming with 10 minutes to spare, but clearly I didn't time things right. Uh, Anyway, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. I'll give you a brief uh, presentation uh, of the research we're uh, involved with. And of course, uh, uh, if there will be any number of questions at any time, you can interrupt me. Uh, if I could have the next slide, uh, this is it. So uh, we're all familiar with our own wake sleep cycles. Uh, I'll talk about some people that are uh, quite bothered by their wake-sleep cycles, uh, uh, a heritable form uh, of wake-sleep cycle disorder uh, in a few minutes. But uh, basic research, of course, uh, uh, often tends to begin with uh, a model organism. Uh, we did our uh, or original work, uh, Endrosophila, fruit flies. Uh, this is uh, a record of a hamster. Uh, and this is from a paper that was published in 1960, just demonstrating uh, the presence of an internal clock that they and we have. Uh, so each one of these lines is a 24-hour interval. And uh, the, the animal is in a, in, a, in a cage in a darkened room with constant temperature. So it has uh, no information about time from the external world. Uh, and uh, there's a running wheel uh, in the cage. The animal's able to get on the running wheel at will. And what you see is these deflections are times when each day when the animal uh, is on the running wheel. So these dark areas are continuous activity uh, on the uh, running wheel. And uh, I'm, after all these years, I'm still amazed that this animal has an internal timer that's able to let us look at its records and predict within two or three minutes when the animal's going to get on that running wheel and when it's going to get off that running wheel. So that's a very powerful timer. Uh, there's another piece uh, of information in this, and that is these are 24-hour uh, intervals. And so the records move off to the left. So this internal timer is shorter than 24 hours. It's an imperfect timer, which is one of the reasons this is called circadian for the Latin, about a day. But nevertheless, very precise. And every organism. Uh, that you work with this way will have a species-specific timer that is about 24 hours and works in much the same way. So um, I'm going to jump way ahead. We uh, used uh, uh, mutations, genetics, to uh, pick apart this timer in Drosophila, uh, uh, our favorite uh, model insect. And this is a, a, a highly schematized and, and uh, uh, skeletal uh, scheme of what we found is operating within not only the brain, but within most cells in the fly's body 
and with our bodies to regulate uh, this uh, timed activity, wh whether it, it might be locomotor activity, wake-sleep cycles, or metabolic cycles going on uh, in cells such as those uh, uh, composing our livers. So there are two genes, which uh, one's called period and the other is called timeless, that were discovered in genetic screens. And uh, they're active, actively producing RNA uh, as, as a uh, result of uh, proteins that bind to these two uh, genes. And uh, when the only information present in the cell, uh, uh, with in the absence of any other information <coughs> present in the cell, will cause continuous production of period and timeless RNAs which are, of course, instructions for building proteins. <coughs> One protein would be the timeless protein, the other being uh, the period protein. And those proteins are uh, developed from those RNA instructions in the cytoplasm. But there are several mechanisms that keep these proteins from accumulating uh, by themselves and also uh, prevent them from making a complex uh, in which these two proteins snap together. But when these two proteins are able to snap together, uh, they move from the cytoplasm into the nucleus and block the activities of these green proteins that are causing transcription. So because there's a delay in the formation of this complex, this feedback control comes with an oscillation, producing a 24-hour rhythm, molecular rhythm, inside uh, individual cells. So again, it's a, a highly oversimplified picture, but I know time is, uh, is short here uh, to go on. So uh, what I'd like to now do is tell you how learning uh, about that kind of a mechanism in a fruit fly has helped us understand our own biological clocks. So fortunately, the genes, we've got 10 or 12 genes that actually construct that mechanism that I spoke of. And uh, most of those are carried on in us, that is, uh, relatives of the genes that we find in Drosophila run the, the uh, same molecular mechanism in cells all over our bodies. So we have these clocks in our brains that control our sleep-wake cycles. We have these clocks in our skin, and we don't know what that's for. Uh, we have the, these clocks in our livers, which control metabolic cycles. Uh, so they're all over the body, and it's all a mechanism very like, much like that found uh, originally in fruit flies. So we've been very interested in uh, disorders of sleep uh, that might be due to uh, inappropriate action of these biological clocks. And the important uh, starting point is sleep, but I'll remind you that if we find uh, a problem with a clock that affects sleep, that clock is gonna be present in every cell in the body. So there are many other questions we have about uh, uh, the medical model that arises from those changes. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a sleep phase, delayed sleep phase disorder. These are night owls. Uh, there may be night owls in the room. These are individuals that, that uh, about 5% of the population uh, uh, will complain about uh, a problem of delayed sleep onset and very difficult uh, uh, scheduling uh, in the mornings. You just can't get out of bed in the morning. You can't get to sleep uh, late at night. We've been working with uh, individuals that have a problem where their typical sleep time is around three or four in the morning. Many of them, if left to their own devices, would like to get up at noon. So it's a, a, severe, uh, a severe problem. But we now know it's very prevalent, as you'll see. So uh, what, we, uh, what we learned from uh, there's a lot of data in this, in this slide, and so I think it's overwhelming the computer. <laughs> so so this is, uh, these are records from a control individual and an individual with delayed sleep phase disorder, uh, DSPD. I'm, I may just refer to it as DSPD from time to time. And uh, these are very much like the hamster records that I showed you before. These, however, are in a regular uh, environmental cycle. These are home. Activ actigraphy records, so uh, there are two components. They have an activity watch on their wrist, so that uh, monitors movements for us, and those are deflections just like the hamster running wheel uh, records. And they also keep a sleep log next to the uh, bed uh, with bedtime marked in the sleep log where those red triangles are, and out of bedtimes indicated 
uh, with the blue uh, triangles. So up top, we have a control individual, uh, which you know, has a bedtime of around 11.30 every night and gets up uh, every morning at uh, 7 or 8 uh, o'clock on free days, on vacation days. Uh, this is our DSPD subject, and already you can see it's a very ragged uh, pattern. Uh, there's much more wrong than just the onset of sleep and the offset of sleep. But if you just look at bedtimes, you can see that they're wandering out here in between midnight and 6 a.m. And uh, the average is about 3 or 4 a.m. Uh, for the in bedtimes. Out of bedtimes, uh, again, very often uh, coming up uh, around noon. So it's a, a fairly severe uh, sleep disorder. But uh, the mutation that is responsible for that disorder, uh, we were uh, amazed to find is present in about 1% of the world's population. This is a dominant mutation. You only have to have one copy of this mutation in order to have that kind of behavior. And indeed, that individual has only one uh, mutated copy of this gene. The other one is, is uh, completely normal. And, uh, it, and uh, the, the frequency in different populations can vary quite a bit. For example, if we look at non-Finnish Europeans, uh, and the, the Finns apparently arose from uh, a different uh, history than uh, uh, the rest of Europe. But for non-Finnish Europeans, the frequency is about 1 in 75 individuals. So that would include uh, uh, Europeans and also uh, descendants uh, of Europeans. So a, a, a very high frequency that suggested to us that if we were on the right track, we should be able to find individuals, uh, uh, new individuals in the population that have this kind of a, uh, a genotype and disorder. We uh, uh, entered a collaboration with a group uh, in Turkey at Bilkent University. And uh, this is just some of the data that were collected. We looked at uh, 10 or 12 families uh, that uh, were identified as carrying this mutation. And the, the, the darkened circles and boxes represent uh, uh, females and males that uh, are carriers uh, of this uh, altered, this variant form uh, of this gene. Uh, and I, I haven't named this gene yet, but it is a gene called cryptochrome, uh, which is again found in flies and found in, uh, in us and is uh, critical. In fact, it plays a role very much like timeless plays in Drosophila. It's the substitute for timeless in Drosophila. But the important thing here are these clock faces that just summarize what the uh, non-carrier's uh, midpoint in sleep looks like. So on this clock face, uh, most of uh, uh, the, the, the non-carriers, those that don't carry this variant form of the gene, all have mid-sleep points of about uh, 4 or 4.30 uh, in the morning. Uh, in contrast, all the carriers, uh, this comes out between 6 and 7 in the morning. So clearly, having this uh, mutation for a whole new set of individuals uh, bestows this kind of a phenotype, as well as some fragmented sleep that we uh, don't have time to go into, but certainly a, a, a strong uh, predilection to a sleep disorder if you carry this gene. So uh, I guess <laughs> I don't know if I was supposed to advance that far, but uh, I'll, I'll, leave you, uh, I'll leave you with that uh, uh, slide as a summary. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, sure. I'll take the privilege of the first question, which is noticing the, the ragged nature of the mutant um, patient. Um, it's not simply that this clean pattern is cocked around the clock, is it? It's, it's more complicated than that. That's right. And, and, the, it, and in some cases, there's a mixed phenotype. So, so most of the individuals that we study do have this delayed form of sleep, true to the term delayed sleep phase dis disorder. But we find several inter, uh, individuals that are nappers, fragmented nappers. And so their first uh, onset of sleep might be fairly early in the evening. This would be uh, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, <coughs> 1, 2 a.m., so forth. And uh, uh, these individuals count their first nap as their main uh, sleep episode, even though it might only be three or four, two, three, four hours uh, long. But they will take additional naps uh, at other points uh, around the clock. So what we're doing here is we're taking their, uh, we're taking their nap time that they identify as, as their 
major sleep uh, episode. So you can have that kind of a phenotype or this delayed phenotype or a mixture of the two is what it's looking like. Mm -hmm. Questions? Hi, I'm Tanya. Um, so I was actually wondering about the previous slide about okay. the ethnicities. Um, I noticed that East Asians are zero, but you said that it's in found in 1% of the world's population. Right. Can you explain that? Yeah, so, so if we take all the different populations, there, there are 60,000 individuals that were looked at that were divided. So every individual has two copies of every gene. So we have 121,000 copies of this gene in this database that we are using here. And so that's, uh, that represents 60,000 individuals. And so these are the numbers of genes that are coming from these different groups that are being analyzed. And the 1% the is just a, a summary over all of those different populations, but it is, it is quite variable in its, uh, in its prevalence in different populations. I think it, I, I suspect it reflects where this gene arose and how it spread uh, over thousands of years through, through populations around the world. I've, we, we, you come to this work looking at sleep as the behavior in question, and that's the dominant thing that we we're talking yeah. about. But yeah. you, you mentioned that these clocks are throughout the body. And yes. what are some of the other functions that are driven by the same clocks and possibly disrupted by this mutation? So, so once we, in model organisms like mice, once we recognize which genes are controlling this process, <coughs> um, many laboratories became involved in experiments where you would go into a specific tissue and using uh, genetic means eliminate function of the clock, uh, this molecular clock within just one tissue, such as the liver or the pancreas. If you eliminate this gene, <coughs> or uh, uh, if you eliminate the clock, this clock mechanism in the pancreas, you will become, a, a mouse will become diabetic. If you eliminate this clock mechanism uh, in the liver, you'll produce metabolic syndrome. The animal will, will uh, produce a series of problems associated with obesity, uh, for example. So you've got, you've got critical uh, control of the timing, internal timing, uh, in different tissues with different outcomes when the clock is malfunctioning uh, in, in different tissues. So for example, the strategy most likely with regard to the liver wanting to have this clock is that the animal uh, wants to be uh, hungry when it's awake, not when it's asleep. It's going to be taking in fuel when it's awake, not when it's asleep. And uh, uh, the liver, if it can anticipate, or hepatocytes, if they can anticipate when fuel is going to be available, and also the fact that fuel has to still be uh, available for use, ingested food has to be un available for use when the animal is sleeping, then a rhythm uh, to, uh, to the large uh, network of genes that are responsible for keeping the animal healthy uh, is going to be quite useful. Hi, Jeremy Shatton from New York Genome Center. So is the, say, the tension between the societal norm of, you know, sleeping from 11.30 to 7 or whatever, is that really what causes the disorder? I mean, if, if you just let these people be and let them wake up at noon and that's not a problem and they can find a way to, to you know, have a living and, and uh, will they be not disordered or is it that they really just can't get a good night's sleep? Well, uh, some of both because <coughs> ideally you would have your, uh, if the activities that uh, uh, allow you to function, even, even if you were free living uh, 400 years ago, uh, a hunter-gatherer society uh, to have your <coughs> to have your maximum uh, function uh, out of sync with the natural environment uh, is probably not a terrific thing. On the other hand, uh, uh, if society accommodated that sleep-wake pattern, uh, shift workers would probably do fine uh, with this kind of a pattern. So uh, uh, it cuts both ways. We can, we can, but uh, uh, it, it really is a, a matter of whether or not you're in sync with your environment, whether that's an artificial environment or a natural environment. I've actually got one last question myself, so I'll take the privilege. Um, 
So <coughs> wake sleep cycles um, are controlled by daylight, right? I mean, or, or, or are, are reset by daylight, is that? Reset, so, yes. So it, yes. it's not a perfect 24-hour cycle. There's a little bit That's of interaction right. with the env right. environment to, to get that clarified. Uh, you mentioned um, the liver adapting to the, uh, the cycle of availability of food, basically. Yes. So it this, the clock takes cues from multiple sources. Yes, so uh, there's, a, there's a wild experiment that was done a number of years ago in which a mouse uh, was uh, maintained in a light-dark cycle, 12 hours of light, 12 hours of dark, like New York time, consider it New York time, uh, but was given food only on Tokyo time for an hour every day. So what this meant was these are nocturnal animals. The animal would have to wake up during the day uh, to eat. <coughs> and um, after a few days, the, the animal would develop a routine where it would wake up, eat the food, go back to sleep, and then get on its running wheel all night long. And if you look at the clocks in different parts of the organism of the, of the, of the mouse, uh, you found that the liver and the muscle and the skin uh, had all shifted to uh, the timing of the food, but the brain was still on New York time. So you had uh, a desynchronized animal and permanently, de well, as long as you applied this kind of a, a, a problem, uh, the animal was permanently uh, desynchronized. Now, this is something that is very similar to what happens to us when we have jet lag. So jet lag isn't just a matter of being in the wrong uh, time zone uh, back in New York when you go to China, let's say. Uh, we used to think that, well, it just takes time for the brain to catch up to be in China. But in fact, what happens is different organs get left in different time zones along the way. And so for several, it's a coalition of all of these time zones that uh, is required over that uh, seven or eight day uh, period that it takes to adjust to a, a trip of that length. Which ones ca catch up first and which ones are most The brain delayed? is quick. The, the brain, the, the brain is, is quite fast to adjust, but the, the liver and uh, uh, pancreas, they, they, they're, hard to, uh, they're hard to train. Lee Holtz, Wall Street Journal. You'll forgive a, a speculative follow-up, but what you just were talking about in terms of jet lag and the uh, different rates at which yeah. organs respond, I wonder if you care to speculate about what this suggests about um, our ability to adjust to long-term uh, uh, sl uh, spaceflight duration. I mean, where we're mm -hmm. sleeping not just in an artificial environment, but in a, in a non-synchronized uh, environment. Yes, yes. So it's very important in that kind of a situation to provide a, uh, an artificial environment that will reinforce what we are biologically. So <coughs> if, we're on a, if we're imagining a space flight that is multiple years long, you want to have uh, environmental control that mimics what would be. Uh, it doesn't matter what phase it's on. It could be New York, Tokyo, whatever, but it should be consistent from day to day. But uh, something closely related to this question is shift work. Because shift work, especially shifting on and off, you know, this is, it's very common to have a shift for uh, a week or two or three, and then go to another shift and to advance around the clock. And so that's like a series of jet lag uh, pulses. And um, I do think there's, uh, there's growing evidence that there are medical consequences for, for having that kind of a routine. So that, that really deserves, I think, some special attention. Peter Smith, so the practical implications of this is that if you're traveling to Tokyo and you want to avoid jet lag, you eat on a Tokyo, eat on your destination schedule, is that? Yeah, yeah, do everything on your, uh, everything that you would imagine you'll be doing at your destination. So <coughs> when the flight attendants come around and close all the windows when the, li when the sun's coming up prematurely, they're, they're not doing what they should do to make you, uh, to prepare you for, for, your, for your arrival. Uh, but uh, yeah, in general, as soon as, you, as soon as you're able, you should be trying to expose yourself to that new, new environmental cycle. 
I just wanted to ask an evolutionary question. I mean, this is, you're saying one in 75 non-Finnish Europeans have this gene yeah. that's remarkably yeah. common. Yeah. Um, and so could you speculate as to why it would be preserved? Uh, might it have offered some advantage, uh, like night watchman duty, an early man, or, you know, I, right, I, yeah. right, <laughs> right. Well, a low frequency like that might, might be conducive to that. So most of the, you know, most of the uh, members of the society or the tribe or whatever uh, um, have a different clock, but having some variation within the population provides that kind of a, an opportunity. Another thing we, and we're just beginning to study this, but one of the things we've realized is that glucose metabolism is altered by having a hyperactivity, which is what this mutant uh, does. It produces a hyperactivity uh, of one of these uh, components of the clock. And uh, uh, in uh, model organisms, uh, mouse models, hyperactivity of that clock component produces uh, uh, a much better uh, glucose uh, control than uh, the normal uh, form uh, of the gene. So if there were uh, a problem with uh, glucose uh, metabolism, diabetes, for example, uh, this, would, uh, this would move you in the opposite direction. Now, it's hard to imagine that in a primitive society you would have such an abundance of food that you would be worried about uh, glucose regulation, but uh, we just don't know. Uh, but this is one of the, uh, th that's the sort of, of uh, uh, difference, metabolic difference that we uh, run into that I think needs, uh, needs a careful look. All right. Thank you, Mike. Sure.